Great, thanks Emmanuel very much for leading us in prayer. Um, as I said at the beginning, we are um, finishing a series today called Stepping Forward Together. Um, it's a bit of a different series because it is designed to, to kind of orientate us into church life and, and divided it into three sections. So the first part, we thought about our doctrine, uh, where we stand in terms of beliefs, which is really a commitment to God's word. The Bible is God's inspired word. Uh, and we want it to, to reign over us as a church. And we saw that the, the center of, of the Bible is the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and that we want that to be central to our church life. Uh, then we thought about our identity, where we kind of unpacked uh, a mission statement that you can see there, that we are a gospel-centered community on mission in Cedars Park and beyond. And thought, what does it mean to be gospel-centered? What does it mean to be a community? What does it mean to be on mission? Um, and, and, and in one of the, the sessions, thought about some values, that the word is our authority. In other words, we want to be a Bible church. Um, there's lots of kind of challenges to churches to believe certain things, but actually we want to stand firm on the, on the Bible. Uh, the gospel is our focus, so we want to continually come back to Jesus and what he's done for us in salvation. Uh, worship is our posture, by which we mean uh, we don't just want to know truths in our head, but actually we want to have hearts that are are filled with love for our God. We want to be like Mary, uh, who sat at the feet of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Christ likeness is our pursuit, so we want to grow in becoming more like Jesus, and we know that's a work of the Holy Spirit, um, but we know too that we're called to, to partner with the Holy Spirit in that. Uh, prayer is our bedrock. Um, that's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, community is our endeavor, so we're trying to not just think about me, but actually think about us. How, how can we grow? Uh, as a family. Services are offering. Uh, in view of God's mercy, we offer ourselves a, as living sacrifices, uh, serving him, and then mission is our calling. Lots of words there, really, but actually those main eight ones in, ca in capital letters are, 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 are what we're all about uh, as a church. And, and number five is, is that prayer is our bedrock um, of those values. And the uh, Collins Dictionary definition of bedrock is this. Bedrock is the solid rock in the ground which supports the soil above it. Um, it supports the soil above it. That's how we want prayer to function in our church. Um, and as I've said a number of times, those things are indicational and aspirational, by which I mean they represent who we are, but they also represent who we want to be. We need to grow in these things. Uh, and I'm sure every church, uh, if they're honest, would admit they need to grow in prayer. Um, and, and I'm sure we do. Um, uh, and what we want is for prayer to be central and foundational to all that we do. Um, because a healthy church is a dependent church. We, we rely on God. Um, we've thought in this series about various things like our structure and our activities and our programs, all good and right things. We need those things in place. But actually, if we somehow think we can do things in our own strength, uh, then something's gone very wrong. We are a dependent people. We rely on God. And actually, it's in prayer that we come before the Lord and say, Lord, we need you. We need you. Um, the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. We want God to be building his house. And, and that comes through prayer. It's through prayer that we say we need the power and presence of your Holy Spirit to be at work in us. And so that's what we're thinking about today. We're thinking about prayer, specifically here at the church. Um, this part of the series, this end part, is, is intended to, to uh, show what prayer looks like for us here at the church. Um, I do, though, before that, want to spend some time just thinking about God's Word, thinking about prayer in general in the Bible, uh, which some of which we heard about even in that book uh, for the children, and then thinking specifically about those verses from Ephesians 3 uh, that Emmanuel just read for us. Um, we, we saw, even in that children's book, that God made Adam and Eve for communion with him. They were made to know him, to enjoy him, to speak with him. Uh, and they enjoyed that perfectly before the fall. Uh, and then their sinful choices meant that things changed. They had this estrangement from God. Um, but God, nonetheless, still desired that his people would pray. Um, and actually, the first real reference to, to kind of collective 
the collective people of God is in Genesis 4, so not long after that. And it says, uh, at that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And that is what prayer is, isn't it? Calling on the name of the Lord. Israel was called to be a people of prayer. Uh, even that the name Israel means wrestles with God or contends with God. They were meant to be a people engaging with the living God in prayer. Um, and their whole worship life was structured around prayer. The temple was, of course, a house of prayer, wasn't it? They would go to the temple to pray. Um, the, the, the sacrificial system was designed to enable people to come into the presence of God so that they can commune with God. Uh, right at the heart of the Old Testament, you have the Psalms, and the Psalms are essentially a prayer book, aren't they? Uh, and the thing that's so helpful about the Psalms is that they're there for every season of the soul. When you're rejoicing, there is a Psalm there for you. When your heart feels broken and heavy, there is a Psalm there for you too. There's prayers for all occasions. And, and as we move into the New Testament, we see uh, an even greater sense of prayer, I think, because we see the privilege of prayer even more in the New Testament, I think, than the Old Testament, because it's then that we see the Lord Jesus and hear his invitation to come to God as Father. Prayer was, was central to Jesus. Um, Jesus was, of course, the Son of God, um, and so we might think, well, he doesn't need to pray, does he? He can just command whatever he wants. But actually, Jesus lived by prayer. He was always going, retreating, talking with his Father. Uh, and even that, I think, gives us a window into what prayer is about. It's not just about getting stuff from God. It's actually getting to be with God. That's what the Lord Jesus models to us. Um, and, of course, his disciples noticed that, that prayer is so central to him. Um, and that's what led them to say, teach us to pray. And he taught them to pray that prayer that we just sang uh, a few minutes ago, the Lord's Prayer, which is a really helpful prayer to, to pray word for word, but also a really helpful model, I think, because you've got worship in there, haven't you? Honoured be your name. Not, not going straight after what we want, but honoured be your name. You've got this sort of desire for God's kingdom to come and will to be done on earth. Um, we do ask for what we need. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, we ask for gospel forgiveness and that we'll extend that forgiveness and we ask that God would help us live a holy life. Uh, that's what that prayer shows us. And then as you read through the rest of the New Testament, you see how prayer is so key. The book of Acts models that. The church is powerful. The Holy Spirit's at work. Um, but, but the people are, are at prayer. They're calling on God and God responds because God is a God who responds to prayer. He hears the prayers of his people. Those prayers that you're praying, he hears them and he knows them. And prayer was so key to the Apostle Paul's ministry. Paul was a man of intelligence, a man of strategy, a man of creativity, a man with giftings. But actually, he knew none of those things had any power unless the Holy Spirit breathed on them. And so Paul's always at prayer. He's always engaging with the living God in prayer. And in his letters, we get to see how he prayed. Um, and in our, in our Sunday night prayer times, which we have uh, on the first Sunday of the month, we're thinking about some of those prayers. Uh, and the thing that I've found striking is that Paul nearly always prays for the same thing. I'm preparing a different prayer each week thinking he's praying about a similar thing again there's always different details but a similar thing and his prayers are always centered around the gospel so i don't know about your prayer life but my prayer life very much focuses around what i feel i need what circumstances i would like to be different for me but also for others lord i'm praying for for their healing i'm praying for their provision and all of those things are good and right. We, we're coming to a Father, so we want to pray about anything, any time, any place, any prayer. Um, but actually, that's not the heart of Paul's praying. Paul's prayer is centered around the gospel. So what he's praying is that the gospel will advance so that those who are not yet the Lord's will come to know him. And those who are will somehow see more of the gospel. Because the danger for us, I think, as Christians is we become Christians, we, you know, we, we hear the gospel, we, we say a prayer, we know we're forgiven, 
uh, and, and we sort of think that's a done and dusted deal, which in many ways it is, but actually the reality of it hasn't got so in us that we're filled with the measure of the fullness of God. And that's what Paul wants, that we, we somehow know the love of God so that we're not just complacent. Those of us who know the gospel can so easily be so familiar with it that we start to lose our passion, we start to lose our zeal. If you're honest, you've had periods like that, maybe you're in one, where we're not quite as on fire as we perhaps were. And so Paul's prayers, yes, he'll pray for people's healings. Yes, he'll pray uh, that, that people will have God's provision. But most of all, he's saying, I pray that you see more and more of the love of God in Christ. Because actually, when you see that love, you'll be able to live differently. You'll be able to face challenges. And, and we see that so clearly in the verses that Emmanuel read for us. I want to read uh, verses 14 to 19. Paul says this, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power, so that his spirit is in your inner being, sorry, that his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That is such a typical prayer of Paul. He's saying, look, I'm praying that you'll know the love of Christ. Let's think briefly about, about those words. It starts with these words, for this reason, for this reason, Paul says, I pray. What is that reason? Well, that reason comes in verse 12, just before this, which is talking about the Lord Jesus. In the Lord Jesus, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Isn't that amazing? That we get to come before God, and we don't have to come with timidity. We come boldly. Sometimes people think, well, if, if there's a God, we can never come really with a, a confidence into his presence. And the, the, the truth is, yes, we can. Yes, we can. We can because of the gospel, because the Lord Jesus made a way. He's our high priest. He, he takes us to the Father and gives us his spirit so that we might pray. It's because of Jesus that Paul says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. And think about the language there. The language, first of all, of Father. We come to God as Father. When we pray, we pray to him as Father. We live in a day and age where many people pray. A surprising number of people pray. When tragedy comes, they pray. And I think God is so compassionate and merciful, he hears those prayers. But I don't think people know who they're praying to often. As I said, I do think God is merciful, he hears cries, but actually we have a particular invitation and it's not to a God who is like a genie who just gives us whatever we wish for, and it's not to a God who is distant and we're sort of somehow hoping he might hear. No, we're praying to a father, a father that loves us. Some of you didn't even have that growing up, a father that loved you. That is what God is. That's how the Lord Jesus invites us to come, our father in heaven. And so we're praying to one who hears, who loves to hear. And that's why we can ask and talk about anything. When my children come and ask things, I never say, oh, don't ask me that. I'm happy for them to ask. I might say no, and God does say no, but, but they're welcome to come and ask. And that is the kind of God we come to. And Paul says, I kneel before the Father. I kneel before the Father. When he said that, I'm sure he meant that both literally and spiritually. Um, I think there is something to be said for sometimes just getting on your knees. Um, it's an expression of dependence. Uh, I notice when I do do it, I'm much more attentive in my prayer life, when I actually, my physical posture is on my knees. And, um, and, and I'm actually praying at my bed or whatever, on my knees. There's something about it that causes us to be more focused, I think. But it's a, it's a spiritual thing, too, that he, he's bowed down. This is a recognition of dependence. I'm, I'm before him. Yes, he's my father. Yes, he loves me. But actually, I'm kneeling before him. And, and when Paul says this, he's in a Roman prison. Let's not forget that. So he's kneeling, uh, pr presumably, on a very hard floor, a uh, Roman soldier around him, maybe even tied to him. But he's praying. 
And, and it's interesting that he's praying while in prison because he feels useful for the kingdom of God even though he's in prison. And that is because he is useful. I think that's quite instructive, isn't it? That you could be in prison and useful to the kingdom of God. Why? Because you're praying. And sometimes people think, oh, I'm not very useful for God's kingdom. Friends, Paul was useful when he was in prison because he was praying. And so each one of us can be useful in God's kingdom simply by praying. So Paul prays, and he wants unbelievers to see the gospel for the first time. That's a key part of his prayer. But his particular focus in this text is he wants believers, people who trust in Jesus, to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That's what he's praying, that people will be so in awe of Jesus. Uh, we've talked in this series a lot about wanting to be a gospel-centered church, and, and that gospel centricity comes partly through preaching but it also comes through our prayers what are we praying yes it's good to pray for needs we absolutely need to pray for needs but are we praying these kind of prayers i ask myself that am i praying these kind of prayers lord as a church would you make us see how great how high how wide how long and deep is the love of christ and that's an enormously practical prayer actually because if you are facing challenges, but you know that you are held by Christ, that will strengthen you. If you are being criticized, and people are looking down on you, yet you know you are loved by the living God, that will strengthen you. If, if you are going through a season and it feels like it will last forever, but actually you remind yourself that there is hope at the end because of the gospel, it will strengthen you. So actually, this kind of praying is exactly what we need. And as we pray these things, as we pray these things, Paul says that, I pray that you'll know this love, a love that surpasses knowledge. So that means we need the Holy Spirit to, to reveal it to us. We can't just figure it out on our own. As you do that, you'll be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I don't know precisely what he means by that, but don't you want that? To be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We don't just want mediocre Christianity. We don't just want a tick box. Yes, I prayed a prayer. No, no, we want to be filled to the measure with the fullness of God. And Paul says that comes as the Holy Spirit shows you how loved you are in the gospel. That's what we want. That's the kind of praying that Paul prays. It's gospel-centered prayer. And as I said, in this final part of the series, we're, we're thinking what do these things mean for us? What does it look like for us? So in just in these remaining few minutes, I just want us to think, how can, how can we be a praying church and keep these kind of gospel prayers central to what we do? Um, so as we think about that, I want us to think about how we can pray for one another, how we can pray for our own church family, and how we can pray for those in our community. So firstly, pray for one another. Uh, the, the Bible exhorts us to pray for one another. We should do that at home, but we should do it with each other too. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 6, carry one another's burdens. And friends, when we pray for each other, we're, we're carrying each other's burdens. There's something liberating, something strengthening about praying for each other. We share with one another, this is what I'm struggling with, and we pray for it. And those things we're struggling with, we, we can ask God to take them away. That's good and right. But we're seeing today we don't just want to pray for that. In fact, we don't primarily want to pray for that. We want to be praying, I'm going through a hard season, and my main prayer is that I might know Jesus more through this season. That actually, even though it's circumstantially very different from what I would choose, and I am asking God to change the circumstances, my greater prayer is that I might know the love of Christ more and find my identity in him more. And so we as a church need to be praying for one another. And so I just want to share some contexts, because this is the kind of practical part of the series, kind of almost giving extended announcements of how some of these things are played out in our church. And one of them is home groups. I've referenced home groups before in this series, but actually home groups is a great place for prayer, because you do life together with people, and they remember the things you ask for prayer for. You've gone through journeys of life, cycles of life, pain, pain, painful situations in life. 
And there's people in your home groups that are aware and are praying for you and know what you're going through. I know some of you are eager to get into home groups and we're trying to add more. So, so I appreciate your patience with that. We want to, to add in the future more groups. Um, but that is something that, that I would love to see more of us plugged into um, and we'd, we'd be pleased to speak to you about. Uh, another one is men's and women's breakfasts. There's, there's something healthy and helpful about gathering and just saying to other brothers, other sisters, this is what I'm going through. Sometimes it's more appropriate to do that with just our own gender. There's something good about that. So we have men's breakfast once a month, women's I think every two months. Um, go along to those if you can. Another way we pray for one another is, is we have a prayer team down the corridor. So at the end of a service, you can receive prayer. And, and that ministry has been on my heart since I arrived because I wanted everybody who walks through these doors to know that should they want to be prayed for, they have that opportunity. Every Sunday, should you come here feeling like you need prayer, you can be prayed for. And I encourage you to use that. I know it's a bit daunting walking down a corridor and not knowing who's going to be waiting for you, but the purpose of that is to bring your needs before our Heavenly Father. So if you've got some struggles in life, we want to pray for you. We want to carry those burdens with you. Um, if you've been struck by something, challenged by something in the message, don't just leave it. Go and say, look, I want to be prayed for in this. And there's something powerful about praying for one another. And so we have that ministry um, of praying in the prayer team, which is a room down the corridor there. Um, just one more thing on praying for one another. I, I've said this before, but my hope is that we'll continue to grow in doing that just naturally too. If someone shares a challenge with you and we pray for each other. And I think we're, we're very good at praying for each other, perhaps by saying, I'll, I'll pray about that. And we, God willing, we do go away and do that. The thing I'd love to see us do more, and I say this to myself as much as anybody, is doing it there and then. When someone's shared something with us, just saying there and then, would you, would you be happy for me to pray for you in that? And, and sometimes we feel intimidated by that. We don't feel we have the words. But actually, God, God isn't looking for words. He's looking at our hearts. So if someone shares something and they're really struggling, why not end that conversation by just saying, can we pray about that here and now? Father, I pray for my friend here who's struggling. Lord, you know what's going on in their life. Would you help them? And would you remind them they're not alone? Would you remind them of the love that is in the gospel? Something like that. That's all you need to pray. And it's a very powerful thing to pray like that. So let's grow in praying for one another. Um, praying for our church. Uh, it's, it's really important too that we pray for our church. It, it's, it's good and right to do that in our homes, but it's also good and right that we do that together, that we come corporately and call on the living God together. The book of Acts shows the Holy Spirit powerfully at work. That every time you, you see some sort of powerful Holy Spirit moment, it's not long before you read before or after that the people were praying. The people were praying. Prayer needs to be key to the church. Uh, as I said, we can organize things and try and do them to the best of our ability, but we want the power of God. And that is something that only he can do. But he seems it's a repeated pattern of God to respond to prayer, to people saying, Lord, we welcome you. We need you. Come Holy Spirit and work amongst us. So there's some opportunities for that. You do that, some of, some of you in your home groups, but some other things. We, we meet at 10 o'clock. Uh, it's a very small number of us to pray uh, in a little room down the corridor where we have that prayer room. Um, sometimes in that, that meeting, we'll pray for needs of individuals, but that's not the primary focus. The primary focus is to pray for this meeting, and if we have a Sunday evening meeting, to pray that the Holy Spirit would be at work in those times. Why not come and join us for those times? 10 o'clock every Sunday, we'd be pleased to have you. Um, another one, on the first Sunday evening of each month, except for August, just to confuse you because that's next week, normally on the first Sunday evening of each month, we gather to pray. And, and it's a small number of us. Um, prayer meetings are often a small number. Um, but actually, I'd love to see that meeting grow. Um, if, if someone were to ask me, what... what event or meeting would you love to grow? 
it would probably be that one because I, I want to know that actually, yeah, we're recognising our dependence on God. And, and prayer meetings at times, if we're really honest, they're not always the most thrilling things. Sometimes they can be, sometimes they're not, if we're honest. But actually, God is responsive to his people's prayers. And so I'd love to see that meeting grow where we come together and begin the month by saying, Lord, we're coming to you because we recognise that we are dependent on you. So we need to, to be praying for our church. We, we can run programmes, but actually we want God to be at work. So we pray for our church. Final thing, as we come to, the cl- to close, praying for our community, by which I mean the, the Cedars Park community. We're called, of course, to pray for our world, to pray for our nation, but here, uh, in these final few minutes, I do just want us to think about Cedars. The truth is that God can radically transform a community. And and he can do so very quickly. Now, now God is pleased to work through events, through people, and so it is good and right that we put on things that we think are engaging and creative. Uh, But even as we thought about um, outreach the other day, we saw uh, our calling to be to have gospel integrity in declaring the truth about Jesus. And we saw, too, that there's that component of creativity. How can we engage our community? But we also ended by thinking about the fact that ultimately it is God who works. God is sovereign. And it is him who opens the hearts and minds of unbelievers. And so we want to be praying to God because he can do work that we cannot do. We can't make dead people live. And that is what the gospel does, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And God can, can change things very quickly, friends. Um, when he does that, it's called revival. There, there's been periods in church history in our nation where the church has been very weak, and people have said it's dying out. And people have prayed, and God has worked. The nation has been revived, and it's come back to him. Now, we can't control that. We can't guarantee it. But it is always preceded by prayer. That's just a pattern. And sometimes people today say the church is dying. Uh, And when they say that, I've got two thoughts. One is uh, you need to get out more because actually the church isn't dying. It may be dying in parts of England, but actually if you go to China, you go to uh, South America, you go to Africa, the, the gospel's exploding in various nations. The church is thriving. So if you look at our little tiny island and say the church is dying, yeah, with a small vision like that, yeah, it's decreasing. But actually globally, it's growing all the time. The church is getting bigger and bigger globally. Don't let anyone ever tell you that God's church is dying. Christ said he'll build his church, and he's building it in other nations exponentially. But in our islands, this little patch that we live on, yes, it's true, the church is declining. But even here, God's doing things. And God can do them again. He can do more. He can revive his church. And prayer is so key in that. There's a a man called Paul Miller who writes really helpfully on prayer. I've mentioned his book, The Praying Life, before. Um, Recommend that book to you just for personal prayer. He also wrote a book called The Praying Church. And Paul Miller says this, All great movements of the kingdom begin low and slow. With hidden prayers who keep up, who keep showing up to pray. That's the kind of prayer meeting I'm talking about on those Sunday nights. It's low, it's slow, sort of hidden, but people keep showing up, right? So he doesn't glamorize it. I like that. All great movements of the kingdom begin low and slow with hidden prayers. He's not talking about prayers, he's talking about people who pray, prayers who keep showing up to pray, who pray when they don't feel like it. So they're showing up even though they're not really in the mood. Who pray when there's no change. They're praying even though they don't see a whole lot going on. Who pray when they're discouraged. They're continually in prayer and then they slowly attract other prayers to join them. That's really honest and real, isn't it? He's not glamorizing it. He's saying at times it's hard work, at times it's mundane, but actually that's how movements start and God often then chooses to work. We can't work out how he responds. We can't work out why he does. But God, in his sovereignty, has decided and declared that he will incorporate our prayers somehow. And so we need to be praying for this estate. Lord, would you be working on this estate? Lord, we're going to be doing what we can, but actually it's you that we're asking to breathe upon this place. Would you heal broken lives? Those people who are far from you and rebelling against you, Lord, would you bring them back to yourself? 
And, Lord, and friends, he can do that. He can draw people. And so we need to be united in praying and believing. Let's have great expectancy that God can work. Our reading closed with these words. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, immeasurably more than we, all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We're asking big things, but he can do even bigger things. Isn't that wonderful? That is our God. So great is his power. And notice it's his power, but his power works in us. What a reality. Lord, we need more of your power. Let's be asking for more of his power to be working in us so that his church is extended, it's built up so that unbelievers come to Christ and those of us who are in Christ are strengthened, rooted in love. Friends, we need to believe and, and pray for big things from God because our God is a big God. John Newton, the hymn writer, uh, uh, who wrote Amazing Grace, that will be the one you know, uh, he says this, don't worry about the suit that you need to prepare, but listen to the rest of it. Come, my soul, thy suit prepare. Jesus loves to answer prayer. He himself has bid thee pray. Rise and ask without delay. Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. Got away with words, has Newton. Let's be people that pray. We're coming to a king. Let's bring big requests because he's powerful and we can never ask too much. So friends, that concludes not only this message but our series. It's a series that we've thought about this essentially, that we are a gospel-centered community on mission in Cedars Park and beyond. And even our prayers need to be focused around that, that we are gospel-centered. We're a church, a community on mission in Cedars Park and beyond. We need to keep the gospel always a, as the focus, the finished work of Jesus. That's what unites a church. It's not our programs that unite us, it's what Jesus has done for us. We keep him and his work at the center. And we're a community. We're not just individuals who have this salvation and just kind of do life on our own. No, no, we give ourselves to each other in love and service. We're a community. And then he sends us out. God wants to use us to share this good news of Jesus with those in our community that others too might come to know and love him. Friends, we're coming to a king. Large petitions let us bring for his grace and power as such that we can never ask too much. Let's pray. Father, we come to you as the one who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. And you do that according to your power that somehow is at work in us. And you do that for your glory, through your church and through your son. And you do that for all generations. Lord, we are here to testify that, that your church is alive and active. You do it through all generations. So many times people have said throughout history that the, the church of Jesus will die. But it will not die because you promised that you will build your church. And you are building your church throughout this world. And Lord, our great prayer is that we are part of that and that we're not just an inward-looking part of that, but we are an outward-looking part, a, a group of people who love you and love our locality and seek to share Jesus with it. Father, we thank you for this prayer of Paul that, that, that says that he, he prays that we'll know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Lord, I want to pray that for my friends here. I want to pray it for those who are not yet Christians. If there be any in this room, may they know that that love is for them. Lord, that the love of Jesus is so strong and perfect and, and right that it is offered to all. Lord, there is no sin that we've done that disqualifies us from your grace if we come in repentance. So, Father, if there be anybody here who doesn't yet know you, may they know that they're loved by you and they can have their sins forgiven. Lord, for those of us who are Christians, I want to pray a few things. I want to pray, Lord, for those who maybe are just feeling apathetic about their faith, Lord. They, they know this stuff, they believe this stuff, but it just feels mundane. Lord, what we need is for your Holy Spirit to so thrill us again with the gospel that we see the eternal love of God, which is displayed in Christ. And through that, your Holy Spirit causes the fullness of the measure of God to dwell in us. Lord, would you do that? For my friends here who just feel like the Christian life is bland, would you reawaken their heart to the love of God? And Father, for my friends who are suffering at this time, 
Lord, feeling struggles and pains and hurts of various kinds. May their eyes too be on the gospel, knowing that they are not abandoned by you in their hard situations. You are with them and you're a future for them. Lord, we thank you that the future for all of us, if we're in Christ, is to be with you and to commune with you. And prayer will be so natural, just like the air we breathe, because we'll be in your very presence at that time. Until that day, keep us strong, keep us focused on Jesus. May we indeed be a gospel-centered community on mission in Cedars Park and beyond. And we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.